Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Dennis Burgess. Uh, I am a speaker at Wispapalooza, and uh, I would like to go over some of the uh, presentations that I did, or a presentation that I did at Wispapalooza 2023. Uh, this session is about internet hygiene, and I would like to just kind of go over this again, uh, and basically make a YouTube video so that everybody can learn from, uh, of course, the presentation, uh, and such. Of course, I don't have my other speakers and the uh, presenters and such, uh, so we're just going to kind of go over what uh, I presented. Um, another reason why I'm doing this is because my voice was basically gone. I, I, I had a very, very weak voice during this presentation, so I just kind of want to go over it again so that everybody knows about it. Again, my name's Dennis Burgess. I've been in the WISP industry since 2001. Um, Link Tech, been with Link Technologies Incorporated since 2006, uh, TowerCoverage.com since its inception. I am a Microtech certified trainer. I'm also an author of two Learn Router OS books, and I have been consulting since 1997. I've uh, been in the consulting industry pretty much uh, my entire career, so I have definitely seen a few things. So what we're going to talk about today is a very few items uh, that I think is very important that everybody should know about. Uh, one is a thing called BCP38. This is Best uh, Control Practices 38. Uh, we're going to be talking about how you should be using BCP38. Uh, we also are going to talk about inbound port blocking from the edge interface from your uh, exit or your transit interface to the internet. And then we're going to talk about some services. Uh, in particular, we're going to talk about the Team uh, Kumru. Um, I call it Kumru. I think it's it, it's pronounced very oddly. It's a Welsh word, I believe. Uh, but uh, uh, they offer some free services that they use BGP. Uh, we're going to be talking about the UTRS BGP service, which is used for DDoS blocking. And we're going to be talking about the Bogon service as well. And the very last thing we're going to be talking about is the Pi-hole recursive DNS uh, with and without restrictions. So let's kind of get started. The very first thing is called BCP38. Uh, this was actually based off the RFC 2827. So if you want to go Google that, please do. Um, basically, what this what this says is it allows you to both in uh, ingress uh, filter data coming into your network, and you can egress filter data going out of your network. Now, typically, you are responsible for XYZ IPs, and you could have you know, 20 prefixes, you could have one prefix. What we want to do with BCP38 is really add two address, uh, I'm sorry, add two firewall rules. And these are going to be in our forward chain. What these are going to be is allow uh, forward chain if the source address list is not our local IPs uh, list. And this local IPs list is any of your public IPs that this network is responsible for. And if it's not from the local IPs, and we're going to go out our WAN interface, this is our egress filtering, we're going to drop that. So we don't want to forward packets from IPs that we don't know. So again, this is BCP38. It allows you to block egress of packets that shouldn't be going out on the public internet. And I'm going to talk about the DDoS tax and how all that works in a second. The second rule that I also recommend is adding a chain forward. Destination address is not local IPs, but the difference is in WAN. Uh, my in interface list is my WAN interfaces. Again, so if you have multiple BGP peers, you add a interface list for each of those BGP peers. Uh, these are what we call our exit interfaces. And basically what this says is if it's coming in our WAN, but it's not going to our local IPs. And again, our local IPs are only our public IPs uh, that we're responsible for. We want to drop all those as well. Now, let's kind of go into a little history and why this works really well. So many DOS attacks are generated by spoofing an IP address. Okay, so let's just say you have a workstation or you have a computer on your network and let's say it's grandma's computer. Grandma clicked on something she shouldn't have and now she has uh, a, what we call a rabbit program running. Um, it's basically a virus that runs a program that then goes back to a command and control system. So this program or this rabbit is running and it basically SSHs to a very specific IP or very specific 
DNS name is more common. Uh, and now it's basically sitting, uh, think of it as a, like a chat room, that if you knew this IP or this dynamic DNS name uh, and you SSH to it, you would actually see, you know, probably hundreds, if not thousands, and tens of thousands, and in many cases, hundreds of thousands of other computers waiting for commands. So this is how uh, a lot of the crypto uh, uh not miners, but the crypto uh, viruses work. The crypto virus gets on a computer in a network, and now it spreads, and it tries to get onto as many computers as possible, but it doesn't actually encrypt the data and ask for money. What it does is it sits there and waits because it's connecting to its command and control system. It's getting those commands from the command and control system, and only once those devices think and the operator says, I think most of the devices are uh, infected. I think I can issue a filter command or an encryption command now. So when they issue that encryption command, magically what happens is now immediately on the computer screen, it says, oh, your files are being encrypted or they are encrypted. Please contact this or send us Bitcoin, etc." And this is actually one of the big issues that we have currently going on in uh, general. But if they wanted to, these people who run this command and control network that run that server, they can sit there and issue a command. Hey, I wish to send an attack to a specific IP. Now, with DNS denial service attacks, you actually get uh, I think it's actually even greater now, but I believe it's a 1 to 53 times greater data throughput than what you put out. So what happens is, is that computer will send to DNS, uh, to its DNS servers, hey, I need uh, this response, okay? So let's just say I want oracle.com. I'm just going to use that as an example. Well, oracle.com uses DNSSEC, and you know now you're sending this little bitty packet that says, hey, I want this particular uh, uh, IP or this particular uh, uh, information back. And it sends it to the upstream DNS servers. It sends it to the uh, Google. It sends to whatever DNS server is probably configured, as well as probably several others, again, based on the commands from the command and control system. And then once that packet goes out, it hits the DNS server, and then the DNS replies, just like it should. Now, the difference is the packet that is being generated by all of these rabbits is not sourcing from your computer. It's actually sourcing from the target, the, 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 uh, the denial of service attack target that they wish to send the denial of service attack from or to. So in this particular case, now we have, you know, tens of thousands of computers sending DN valid DNS requests to servers from a source IP, a single source IP, okay? And you have a whole bunch of computers doing it. Well, now you have a whole bunch of DNS servers getting a perfectly valid response and then sending that response to the source address that you sent it from. Well, since you sent it from a uh, uh, another IP, you spoofed that IP, guess what? That source address is now going to be where we're going to reply and where the destination is. So now you have a whole bunch of computers sending responses for that huge reply, this DNSSEC reply that's 4,000 bytes or 5,000 bytes because it's DNSSEC, etc. And it's all flooding to one destination IP. So now instead of you send, you know, again, you're sending out just a few meg or a few hundred K of traffic, but you're generating based on the DNS servers you're using, you're generating hundreds upon thousands of megabits of data to that individual IP that they wish to be attacked. Now, if your DNS servers are configured correctly uh, with recursion prevention, uh, for non un, uh, for non known IPs, then guess what? Your DNS servers aren't going to be affected. They're not going to reply. They're going to say, "Hey, you're coming from a source that I don't know. I'm not responsible for, so I'm not going to send the response." So that's one one big key here. But many DNS servers, such as Google, the Cloudflare, all those those are recursive DNS servers that are open to the public. They're just going to see it as a valid request. That valid request it goes out. 
and then it comes they answer it and it goes to the target and now the target is uh, uh, spoofed now the difference is that if you had these bcp38 rules in place that source address from where you're sending that ip since it's not from your local ips list it should be blocked on your firewall so that request never goes out and never hits those public dns servers Hence, you are a good net citizen. You have blocked anybody on your network from sending those spoofed packets. And that's really what the whole BCP38 is about, is preventing those spoofed packets. Okay? Now, that is just one very specific in instance, but you can also do that for uh, pretty much any of those rules. Uh, again, those two rules right there in the, uh, the screen is probably all that you need. Now, if you have IPv6, which I hope everybody is running v6, of course, you can do the same for your IPv6 firewall as well. Now, inbound port blocking. This is kind of a controversial topic. Um, we actually have, uh, when net neutrality was enforced, uh, we actually had some issues with this. Uh, and now that the FCC and, and such are looking at net neutrality again, it definitely can be an issue. Now, it shouldn't be an issue because all you have to do is say, this is my reasonable network management practices. And on your website, you need to have two things. One, you need to define it. You need to say, hey, we're going to block coming from outside of the network uh, from your exit interfaces. We're going to block various protocols uh, from forwarding into your network. Now, I always recommend on every router basically blocking NetBIOS because as an ISP, NetBIOS is, uh, should never be transmitted. Uh, but something else that you probably want to block inbound, um, things like SNMP. Is there anything on your network that you can think of that SNMP should be used for? And SNMP is simple network management protocol. It's used to monitor uh, routers and devices that's running out there. And Typically, if it's a company or a corporate network, they're going to have a VPN, so you're not going to see that. But uh, again, on your local network, you don't want people probing your devices or attempting to probe your devices. So again, block UDP 161 uh, for SNMP. Um, same thing for Winbox, uh, FTP, Telnet, and SSH. Um, I don't like to allow SSH, Telnet, uh, and FTP onto my network. Because, or onto our networks because, again, it's typically not needed. Now, there is, and I said there is, two things you need to have on your website. One, you need to have all these DNA, all these ports listed, and you need to basically say, hey, guess what? Uh, there needs to be, these are our reasonable network management. We're blocking these inbound ports. Uh, I know a lot of ISPs that block inbound port 25, okay, and that's mail. Uh, now, the second thing is, is you need to have an exception list. And that basically needs to have uh, corresponding a exception rule or a method to get an exception on your website. Uh, and that will basically satisfy net neutrality. You are defining what you're going to be blocking inbound. You have listed that on your website, which is good. And then you basically say, now, if there is a valid reason, here is a form or here is a method for you to request us to unblock those. OK, uh, but those are just some examples of that. Now, uh, if you have uh, ubiquity radios, microtech radios, etc., you can, of course, add uh, port 80 and 443 if you don't want them running those services. Um, but it, like if you have a Cambium radio that can be managed from the public IP that you gave your customer, do you really want an outside device outside of your network to uh, connect to the local uh, uh, CPE and actually manage it? or actually try to manage it, I mean, that's not something you really want. So again, you can probably block those as well. Some other examples of things to block, uh, basically uh, port 8080, 8181, uh, 8888, those are common external router interfaces for people to manage their routers externally. Uh, again, not something that you typically want uh, you know, someone in China to do. But also, you know, these are some of the things you can do this on uh, the local devices, your local uh, microtechs uh, and routers, so that you can actually block internal customers as well. 
Now, let's talk about Team uh, CY... MRU, uh, Kumru as I believe what they call it. So one of the things that they have is they have a UTRS, Unwanted Traffic Removal Service. Well, what happens is, is you would sit there and again, you're doing BGP with your upstreams. You will then uh, create a BGP multi-hop link to the UTRS BGP peer servers. And the goal of this is just like if you have uh, black hole services with your upstream. So Cogent, Hurricane, they all offer black hole services. They they can do it several different ways. Uh, I believe Cogent does, uh, they actually have very similar service as CYRMRU. It's called their black hole servers that you would peer with uh, versus uh, things like Hurricane and, uh, and uh, AT&T. Those guys, you basically just send a community string with a slash 32 or a slash 128 uh, that you wish to uh, have blocked. Now, in those particular cases, with Team Kumru, uh, you can, of course, do this with them. So if you have a slash 32 being attacked, you advertise that slash 32, and now you're going to advertise that slash 32 individually as uh, to the, the CYMRU servers. And then all of its members, which is right now over 1,300 of them, will black hole traffic to that IP on their network. So the whole idea is that if everybody used a black hole server, if everybody on the planet used this, then uh, you know most of your denial of service attacks would basically be gone. Uh, but keep in mind, when you're under a denial of service attack, that's not the time to try to set up these services. You need to have a plan in place. You need to have a, uh, you know, a document that here's how you would black hole these items. You need to have all of your black hole peerings configured already. All that needs to be done prior to you uh, getting a denial of service attack so that then you can implement it and stop the traffic from coming in. Uh, very, very simple. Now, the only thing with uh, Team Kumru is that you definitely need uh, to accept anything that comes from them and block those. So you need to put a uh, black hole filter on any IPs that you learn from them as well. So very, very great service. It will definitely help with uh, a lot of denial of service attacks and it's totally free. So definitely take a look at uh, Team Kumru UTRS services. Uh, now, bogans or bogons are prefixes that should not appear in your routing table. Uh, and let me rephrase this. It should not appear in the public routing table. Now, there's two different types. Uh, you basically have unallocated and then you have uh, what they call Martians. Uh, Martins. Um, Martins are RFC 1918. These are reserved address spaces. Uh, and then unallocated is anything that has not been assigned to a regional registry uh, as of yet. Uh, basically, any prefixes you get from these, you would simply black hole them on your router because guess what? Those uh, services or those IPs should not be anywhere on the internet. They should not be uh, anywhere uh, moving traffic as well. So definitely uh, ways of getting that done uh, as well. And again, this service is free from Team uh, Cumru as well. Lastly, we're going to talk about the recursive DNS. So uh, Pi-hole is a free, high-performance DNS server with caching. Um, first off, if you have a ISP that has two, 300 cu customers, you should be running your own pair of recursive DNS servers. Now, let's kind of go into depth with DNS, uh, a little bit, a little bit deeper. So there are two different types of DNS servers. There are authoritative. These are the DNS servers that are responsible for a domain name or a reverse IP lookup. Okay, so a uh, domain name for a IP address. Okay, most ISPs, uh, or at least most WISPs, do not operate authoritative servers. You typically will use your web host or whoever um, your uh, DNS registrar is, or whoever your domain registrar is, I should rephrase that. You will basically use them, and they will control your DNS. So anytime someone says, um, what is www.towercoverage.com? It has to go to the root servers. The root servers would then say, well, it's a .com. So now you have to go to the .com servers. So then you go to the .com servers and say, hey, who has www.towercoverage.com? Well, .com servers say, well, I don't know. I'm not an authoritative, but 
I do know who uh, in what DNS servers are responsible for TowerCoverage.com. So it gives you those DNS entries. So then your server uh, or your machine will go to those DNS queries. And hopefully it'll be NS1, NS2, NS3, etc. at TowerCoverage.com or at .TowerCoverage.com. And then you will get an authoritative answer because those servers are set up as authoritative. Okay. Now, Pi-hole is a DNS server with caching, but it is a recursive server. A recursive server is one that you give your customers so that they can do internet lookups. It also adds to cache. So that whole process I just said, when your customer goes to your local DNS servers, your local DNS servers goes through that entire process to get the DNS query for www.towercoverage.com. Once it gets an authoritative answer, it then will also get what its TTL is. And it will sit there and say, uh, what is my, uh, uh, it'll, it'll add it to the cache for uh, however long the TTL or time to live is. Typically, time to lives are only a few hours, but many services and many websites uh, don't even define that. So you can, you can store your DNS caching IPs for, heck, 30 days if you wanted to. Okay, that's up to you. But now, now it's in its cache. So now the next person that goes to TowerCoverage.com, it doesn't have to go through that whole entire process. It already has a answer in its cache and it's within its valid cache time. So guess what? It's going to just give the answer. Fast, e uh, fast DNS queries equals fast internet. And I cannot stress this enough. Uh, I have had multiple people, multiple ISPs have issues with their upstream DNS. I have had people have issues with Google DNS and even Cloudflare DNS. And it's not something that you can actually get resolved quickly. I'll use this as an example. Is Google DNS a free service that you're not paying for, that you have no contact information for, you have no phone numbers, etc.? Is Google DNS a good DNS server to give to your customers? The answer is no, of course not. Your local ISP server, uh, your local servers should be what you typically give. Now, if a customer wishes to put in 8888, that's up to them. If they want to use 1111 for Cloudflare, they can do that. But again, your locally hosted and what you typically hand out to your customers should be your own DNS servers. More DNS queries you get, the faster those DNS queries are, and the faster the internet will seem, okay? Keep in mind, when you open CNN.com, I think you get something like 80 DNS queries, all right? If you have all those DNS queries cached, guess what? That means now we're not having to go out and look for it. We're not having to go out and get it. All those queries are cached. You're going to have them instantly. Uh, and again, faster queries equals fast internet. I do not recommend using Microtech DNS as a, uh, a DNS, a recursive DNS query server. Uh, it has some capacity limits, etc. Uh, so I would always run, uh, at very least, at least a pie hole server. Now, if you have a small office with 10 computers and you have a Microtech in there, yeah, you can set that up as a DNS server. However, that DNS uh, service needs to be secure. Be very, very careful. With Pi Hole, it is designed to actually run on a Raspberry Pi, so very, very lightweight. However, we run it uh, on many ISPs as virtual servers uh, under either Docker or underneath uh, as a VM uh, server. Uh, a lot of times we will use a Proxmox server. We'll just run a, uh, a Docker instance on it and uh, run Ubuntu on it. Simply put Raspberry Pi. It's very easy, very low resource requirements. And on top of that, since it's on your internal network, you don't actually have to add a public IP to it. However, if you do have a public IP, you need to make sure that the machine is uh, set for recursion only, and that recursion is only for your IPs. So the only IPs that should be able to get to it are uh, very specific and defined. All right. Now, Pi-hole has a server or a service that basically allows you to download lists. And these are um, DNS entries, so DNS names, um, that you can actually block. 
and they have a number of miscellaneous uh, or uh, miscellaneous lists. Uh, if you go to fireblog.net, this is the primary repository for those, or I, from what I have found, um, they have a number of different types of lists. I like to set up as a pair of pie hole servers, and I like to enter the malicious lists. These, going back to the whole DDoS thing, remember we were talking about that, uh, these are entries for things that are command and control system DNS names, the crypto locking, phishing, and malware uh, entries. So these will basically stop the rabbit from getting to its command and control system. So even though the computer is infected, it's not participating or it can't get to its command and control system. Therefore, it's basically kind of like a lame duck. It's not doing anything. All right. Uh, now, again, part of the net neutrality thing, you definitely need to define that, hey, here is our pie hole servers that we give out. It will have malicious lists that are updated daily uh, so that if we are, uh, if you get something like that, hopefully it can stop it. However, there's no guarantee, uh, et cetera. But you need to define that in your uh, net neutrality statements to say, yes, we, we do this. Uh, I do know other ISPs that they load it up. They do adware blocking. They do uh, tracking, uh, all kinds of stuff on there. And again, it's kind of up to you on what you want to do. However, uh, I would recommend as an ISP that you really just stick with uh, really the malicious lists on that. Um, there are other other lists out there. Uh, there is tracking and telemetry listing. There's advertising listings. There's also suspicious, suspicious lists, uh, which are just things that, hey, we don't think these are valid, but, you know, we, we might want to, you know, you might want to look at that. So, again, we have had uh, customers that they will run a pair of pie hole servers that they uh, give out with DHCP that basically block the malicious list. These are known malicious uh, URLs or uh, uh, DNS names. But then they might actually spin up another pair that basically blocks telemetry, advertisements, suspicious everything, or a lot. So definitely options there. Uh, again, you can definitely do that if that's something that you want to do. Uh, but then you also might have a, a third pair that has no blocking at all. All they are is recursive DNS servers for your customers to use with no blocking at all. This gives your customer choices, but sometimes I think it's just simpler just to install the suspicious list. Uh, I'm sorry, not the suspicious list, but the malicious list and, and go from there. So with that said, we have talked about one method to block command and control DNS names from getting resolution to customers. Uh, how you can use the free uh, team uh, Kumru services, such as Bowguns and the uh, uh, UTRS to help block DDoS attacks from getting to your network, as well as uh, to block items that shouldn't be in your global routing table. Uh, how to block inbound ports that are commonly used for, from externally from your network and what ports I would recommend. Uh, and how to prevent spoof packets from entering or leaving your network. Very, very simple and basic. Well, with that said, again, I knew this was going to be pretty quick. Uh, I hope everybody has, uh, if you have any questions, of course, you can send those to support at linktext.net. Uh, otherwise, thank you and have a great day.